Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our day five. This last day of our 2022 Extempore PD Extravaganza for part two of our workshop with Dr. Joe Barcroft from Washington University in St. Louis, increasing vocabulary learning during communicative, task-based, and content-based activities. If you missed part one, that was yesterday, that's okay. It's already uploaded to our YouTube channel. You can view it there. And of course, this will be recorded as well for later viewing. Joe, I will let you take it from here. Okay, great. Thanks, Grant. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so we're going to continue um, along the lines of uh, what we, were, we had started yesterday. And, um, but I think today, <clears throat> taking things a little bit slower and having some more time to interact about preparing materials for vocabulary instruction. Uh, like Grant said, if you weren't able to be here yesterday, that's fine. Um, there's a handout that may be useful to you that has some, uh, a list of principles on it and a checklist and things like that. And we're still gonna try to involve you in the, um, in the all group discussions and also um, in the, uh, the one uh, pair group, uh, the pair work discussion that we're planning to do. So, so welcome to everyone. And um, so I wanted to start off today with a different type of warm up activity, again, using the chat, um, but, but on a more general topic, um, which just has to do with any kind of idea that you might have, or any question that you might have, or comment that you might have related to L2 vocabulary learning or L2 vocabulary instruction in general, or for those of you who were here yesterday or are familiar with the IBI approach, it can also be about that. So if you look here on the, and, and, and after we go through and do the warm up, then I'm gonna present an outline of the, the six items that I have to cover today, um, and then we'll go from there. So if you look here on the, the first slide and you see part one, it says individually, please jot down one question one comment or idea that you have related to vocabulary learning and instruction in general, or the IBI approach in particular, okay? So I'm just gonna give everyone just somewhere on a scratch sheet of paper, if you think about that, um, jot it down. Uh, if you type it somewhere um, in digital space, then it'll be easy to paste in the chat because that'll be the next thing we're gonna do. So uh, please take about uh, 60 seconds to go ahead and think of some ideas. And, and Grant, thank you for posting that handout from yesterday. It, that's in the chat too for anyone who might want to look at that. Of course. Okay, so once you have uh, your ideas jotted down, now if you'd like to go ahead and just share, cut and paste for the chat, and we'll take a uh, we'll take a few minutes. Here's this is part two. Um, we'll take a few minutes to go go through them. So I'll wait until the ideas are posted, and then we'll start with Alejandro's here on the top um, once everything's posted. Oh, Celeste, I, I see your question. I have a nice, I think, follow-up study that'll be interesting to you today regarding the sentence writing. And, and we'll be talking more about that as well. 
um, in terms of what to expect from different types of tasks. Okay, well, why don't I start at the top here with the first question that we can discuss and um, we'll go through these. And if more people have some ideas, uh, either I, again, it's questions, ideas, or comments. Um, and we'll just go through these for a few minutes um, and just to finish the warm up here. So um, we'll start with Alejandro's and feel free um, if, you know, to raise your hand if you wanna comment um, out loud as we go through them, um, if you'd like to do that. So. Here's the question by Alejandro. Can you provide a recommended wor a frequency word list uh, for languages other than Spanish? I see you mentioned Schmidt, Schmidt, and um, Clapham. Yeah. So, or for other than English, not other than English, uh, not other than Spanish. You said other than English. Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, and I can work on, um, I didn't come prepared today to provide them for as many languages as possible. But I know that there is a, a frequency word list for French, and I believe uh, Tom Cobb's website um, from, I don't, it's not, it may be Montreal, but on Tom, Tom Cobb's website, uh, he has one for French. There is also one for Spanish. There's actually a book that just simply lists the 5,000 most frequent words in Spanish. Um, Alejandro, is there a particular language you were interested in? Okay, well, Alejandro, if you comment on that, if there's a particular one, I can look for those. But um, I, I teach Spanish, but uh, I would also like to know about French so I can share it with my colleagues. Okay, thanks, Alejandro. There is one for Spanish, um, and I'm a, I can try to get the full reference for you. It, it's just simply a list of the 5,000 most frequent words in Spanish. So I think that one may be useful to you. So I'll work on getting the reference for you, okay? Um, and Celeste says, I'm still curious to learn more about how sentence writing has a negative effect for language acquisition. Well, I wouldn't say that it has a negative effect for language acquisition. This is one of those issues in terms of, you. we wanna, when we get the research findings from a particular study, not wanting to overgeneralize. This was just simply about the formal aspect of word learning. So learning the word forms. And that is what um, I was wanting to point out has a negative, uh, that, that uh, sentence writing has a negative effect on. And I think we can talk about that more, Celeste, when we get to, um, I'm gonna show you a partial replication study and another study that looked at sentence writing for English speaking students that were studying both well, that we're studying either L2 French or L2 Korean. And the results of that study are similar to the ones I showed you yesterday, but I think it's, there's, the results are also um, more telling in terms of the different L2s and we'll be getting to that. So I hope I can cover that. Um, Chris Bolden, um, we are bound by a textbook that gives 60 to 80 words per lesson. How can we help students learn routine in such a short amount of time? Um, I don't know what the textbook is. One of the topics we'll cover toward the end today is um, supplementing textbooks with, um, with, with the IBI principles to the extent possible. 60 to 80 words per lesson seems like a lot to me. Chris, did you want to comment in particular on that textbook, if you'd like? I, I put it in the chat, but we use Descubre. Okay. And, and I teach in a boarding school and we teach um, like AP at, in year four. So students who are coming in, uh, taking Spanish one for the first time, will have a chance to take AP at the end. So I, just, I feel like we're cramming vocabulary and grammar down their throats all the time. Is it Spanish for Spanish in this for case? Spanish, yes. And are a lot of those words cognates, do you notice or? Um, some of them, are some of them are not they do some word families here and there um but uh mostly brand new words 
Yeah, it seems like a lot to me, but regardless of how, you know, how ambitious your textbook is, um, I think there are things we can use. If they're not, for example, taking it upon, if the textbook is not taking it upon itself to consider, for example, how all of these, this novel vocabulary needs to be presented as input, for example, I think that there are things you can do to supplement, but um, yeah, it seems like a lot to me. And is, can I ask, is the course, uh, is it theme-based or is it communi CLT or TBLT or, or otherwise? Um, it's mostly grammar, so vocab and grammar. Um, they do okay. do different themes like, um, I teach Spanish too, and the first theme is like in the doctor's office. I see. So thematic. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So when we get to the part today about supplementing textbooks, maybe we could talk more about this too, but I, I kind of agree. It seems like a real um, ambitious number of words to, to address in one lesson, but um, yeah. So hopefully a lot of them are cognates that are that are that, that makes it a little less challenging, but as you said, maybe not, right? So okay, um, Grant, you said here I'm wondering about the cognate question we had earlier and how well those cognates are retained, even though they are cognates. For example, if a student sees interesante and can immediately recognize it, how much practice exposure do they need to always produce interesante instead of interesanta or yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Makes yeah. sense, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Grant. Did you want to say more about no, that? Does, does, does that make sense? The question. Yeah, it does, and, and and also they could interpret it. There are many false cognates too, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, like the famous, you know, uh, embarazada, you know, that kind of thing is is not embarrassed. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but. Um, Yes, they're still going to have to refine their knowledge, their L2 specific knowledge, even if it's a cognate. So that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, and you're wondering also the distinction between whether they'll be able to produce it or not, right? So that's, that's really the question, right? Because I feel like in, when, when it comes to input, you read interesante, you're going to know it means interesting, right? But I'm just curious about the, the production aspect, how long it really takes them to really uh, just ingrain I guess repetitions, right? How many exposures to really ingrain interesante instead of instead of say interesanto or interesanta? Exactly, and you know, and quickly students start to learn that I can use cognates as a strategy, and so they start creating, you know, um, using that strategy overall, and they're going to create words that don't exist, for example, and all of that, which you know, I, I think is a normal process. But no, it's a good, it's a really good point. Their receptive knowledge of that vocabulary. The receptive, what they'll be able to understand, will exceed what the, their their productive knowledge. So, great point. Sure, yeah. Thank you, uh, Shannon. You mentioned yesterday that four exposures without interacting with the word was enough to have a learner retain the word for simple record. I did. Okay, I don't. I didn't remember that. But how many additional exposures before a learner can use the word confidently? Um, if I gave an example with four exposures, I didn't mean that that was you know set set that it needs to be for exposures. Definitely, Shannon. I don't know if you want to talk more about it, Shannon. OK. Um, Sorry, my computer took a little while for the video and, and microphone to start up. Um, I, I guess I'm referring to the study that you were showing us about the difference between having students write the sentences and, and recognize the words and just being exposed to the words. And I believe you said that each of the the students who were exposed to the words were exposed to the words four different times for a certain number of seconds each. And yeah. that, that their retention was higher than the students who looked at the word for a little bit longer, but then had to write a definition of it. Wr wrote it in a sentence, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it, it also helps me to clarify a couple of points about the study. You're, you're exactly right for experiment one, they had four repetitions in the no sentence writing group. And as you saw from the results, their scores were high, really at ceiling, really almost all 12 words, right? Um, and in the, uh, the, no, the sentence writing condition, they only had one and for more time in that in the first experiment, because we were trying to create a condition that was similar to something you could really do in real life, right? But then in the, the second experiment, 
they only had one repetition in both conditions. So they were just sitting there studying in the no sentence writing condition, just studying the word mm -hmm. and the results paralleled the other one. So, um, so it wasn't so much about the number of repetitions that was causing the effect, but, but you make a good point in general. And there, it, there is some research that indicates, for example, let's say you have a X amount of time to present words. Like maybe you have a total of 24 seconds or you have a total of 48 seconds per word. What's the best way to divide up that time? And there is research on this. For example, um, if you have more repetitions at three seconds each, you're gonna get higher means, higher overall averages than then if you have six seconds, uh, half of that time, then, and if you have 12 repetitions, half of, or excuse me, if you have 12 seconds, half of that time. So let's just put it this way. So the lowest score would be 12, if you have 24 seconds, the lowest score would be 12 seconds times two repetitions. The next, the next highest would be six times four, but the highest would be three times eight, right? So it's actually that repetition over time and something I didn't mention yesterday, that the more distributed the repetition is or retrieval opportunities as well, the more they're spread out over time, the better in general terms. Okay. So hope, hopefully that clarifies something about the study too. So thanks, okay. thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, okay, I think we're doing well. I think maybe there's one more, let's see. Puedes usar el diccionario de colocaciones. Del Espanol. Oh, thank you, Claudio, for that comment. Um, when implementing the IBI approach, let's take this one as the last one. Does the teacher have the use, have to use all steps, at least six, or at least in, in every vocabulary lesson? No, it's it's not about the exact number of steps. I, I just wanted for the lesson for today, if you could try to use multiple steps to have that incremental nature so that you're presenting more input in the initial stages and then you're building up over time before you ask students to produce the words and do and expand upon the words in different types of activities. So um, that's why I mentioned um, at least six for the lesson for today, so that you could have that incremental nature of the lesson, right? Um, because, and this is important, I think, for example, with a task-based activity, if you're doing a task-based activity, just jumping in and completing a task when there's a lot of vocabulary that the students don't know, really kind of jumps past one stage that the learners need, which is that, that stage in which they're actually gonna be exposed to and process the words themselves as input, right? Otherwise they're doing the task and also processing the words at input, as input at the same time, which isn't necessarily you know, bad, but it's something that may get in their way and it may be more helpful if they have more acquisition of those words before they're asked to do a lot with them. So that's that was my point about the, the steps. So thank you very much everyone for your comments and uh, questions and ideas. So that was number one here on the outline for today. Um, and I'll just quickly go through what we're gonna do. So for number two, for those of you who uh, we're able to at least start to work on the IBI lesson. And even if you didn't, we're gonna break up into, uh, into pairs to start, to share your ideas, either about the experience of trying to work on an IBI lesson, or if you didn't, or if you're new today and you, you weren't here yesterday, that's also fine. You can just discuss the experience. So if one person did it and the other person didn't, you can accept, discuss the experience of trying to design a lesson like this. And then we'll come back and we'll discuss that together. And then if you look at three through six here, this is what um, I'm trying to open it up more today to, to be uh, a little more interactive today and where you can all give um, some feedback and we can have discussion more. Um, three, I'm gonna ask for volunteers to share their lesson with the whole group um, and their, or their experiences about um, working on the lesson with others in the workshop. And then for number four, it's called Further Unpacking IBI Principles for the Language Classroom. And there, I wanna zoom in and focus on a few of the principles of the IBI approach and talk about some issues and also show you one um, follow-up study uh, that may help to kind of unpack some of the principles a little bit more. 
because the general idea here, again, is it's not about a specific number of steps or a specific number of repetition of target words, but to understand the, um, to move forward with the general approach, right? And then um, before we finish with number five, I'm gonna talk briefly, very briefly about options for supplementing existing textbooks with, I, with the IBI approach. And that'll give us a chance to kind of examine and think about, well, how is vocabulary dealt with by my instruct the current instructional materials that I use, right? And then we'll have some time for uh, final questions and comments. Um, and we'll see where we are with time at that point. So, so I think the next step, I, what I'd like to do is for number two, get into breakout groups and to share and discuss your work on the IBI lessons, which was the goal for today. And you know, for those of you who weren't here, that's fine if you meet with someone who uh, was here yesterday, that person can discuss their experience with you. And um, let's see, I have a question here. Uh, how long in the BO, in BOR, what is that? Mean? Breakout rooms. Oh, in the BO. Okay. Yeah. In the breakout rooms. Um, I was thinking 10 minutes. Uh, Grant, does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds, that sounds fine. I'm good. Yeah, hopefully that's not, if you feel like you need more time, maybe you can send us a message or something to let us know if you want. But I think 10 minutes, try to do 10 minutes and then we're going to talk about it together. Okay. So let's go ahead. Any questions before we go in the breakout rooms, you could just ask them in the chat just to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so if we, we're going to go ahead and go into the breakout rooms now for 10 minutes. Grant, if you don't mind. I got them set. I'm going to open them right Thank now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, we were also chatting here about some other issues, but I wanna go ahead and move on to number three here, which is the request for volunteers to share their lesson and or experiences working on the lesson with other participants in the research, uh, in, the, in the research, in the, in the workshop. So um, if I could get, ask for anyone to volunteer just to talk about their experience, and again, the goal for working on designing these lessons, and I know designing an entire lesson is quite, quite a lot, um, especially in the middle of the summer, but if you even just got started on it or if you completed it, that would be great if you could just share your experience and also just telling us you know, what the nature of the lesson was, if it was part of just general communicative language teaching, if it uh, would be a type of task-based language teaching, or if it's for some content course that you teach that uh, focuses on linguistics or literature or something in particular like that. So at this point, I'd just like to ask if anyone would volunteer to share their experience and, and, and share about their lesson or, or the extent to which they've been able to work on their lesson. Please, please volunteers. And you could, I think you could just raise your hand, right Grant? Yes, that's absolutely okay. an option. Or just, or just unmute and start talking. Dora, go ahead. Thank you, Dora. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was with, I was with Claudia, but Claudia had her birthday yesterday, so she, she, she didn't know what was IBI or you know some of the terms. Anyway, <laughs> so my lesson. Anyway, um, the homework I worked on a French level three. Uh, the title of the lesson, Social Media Influencers. So uh, already the key words, les influenceurs, les influenceurs, uh, les réseaux sociaux. Um, the objectives, the students will identify what are the challenges faced by influencers and what impact they have on society. So here the situation is... Uh, Say okay, the last sentence again. I'm sorry, it cut out a bit. It's a, you said something and something they have on the, the effects they have on society. I didn't get the last sentence, sorry. Yes, so I said um, the students will identify what are the challenges faced by influencers and what impact they have on society. So what's the impact influencers have on society? Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, the assignment here, um, you are a fan of a celebrity, an influencer, who has many followers on IG. The task here, they have to get connected and follow 
uh, the chosen celebrity or influencer, complete a research about their life, find out how and when, why, sorry, how and why the celebrity is an influencer. So real versus fake life. They had to create a video or an infographic about their findings. And of course, present and discuss uh, with their group, you know, by sharing their opinion. So the target words here, I have influencer, brand, snatch, credibility, follow, follower, la la la, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the material, yes, um, I have video clips, flashcards, and of course the words on uh, center streets, etc. And so step one, um, the teacher will present the video clip in segment through Q and A, circling. So for example, how many influencers were in the video? Or um, um, uh, how many followers were on the celebrity account? So in this part, I'm using the targeted vocabulary and the students will rely on the pictures in the video clip. I will repeat the questions in another way. So they're gonna have a repetition of the words. Mm -hmm. um, to present the new vocabulary through input, I will use uh, flashcards or pictures, you know, by saying each word. And then I'll also put on the board, um, the center strips with definitions. And so we read, uh, the students will have to read, that's repeat the words and the definition. And here the goal will be for them to match the words and the definition. Uh, because these are sentence strips, so we can take turns in moving the words or the sentence strip wherever they should be to match the theme and the, and the definition. I don't know if part two, I did it right. Is, is that, does it make sense? Yes, yes. So yes. then in this, in this, uh, yes, in this step, the students will have to ask questions about any misunderstood words. Now, mm -hmm. when I was doing this right here, I was thinking, you know, when we have these abstract words, it's gonna be difficult for me to write that definition in French if I'm doing this with lower level French. Mm -hmm. Because to write the definition of the word, you're adding other words. Correct, correct. So how will I, apart from giving like credibility, how will I act CPR credibility? Uh, yeah, to yeah. explain that uh, word. Well, I mean, what you know, I'll, always one of your alternatives is, is a translation that they may get in written form or something like that. That, okay, may, so, that, okay. that may be fairly clear, but um, you know, you can try to give definitions with that include words that they would know at that level. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, too. But um, but yeah, that can be challenging. This was level three. So whatever they could you if you can come up with definitions you know that would be appropriate for level three that might work or giving examples and so forth yeah anyway so i i don't know if the another person can take over but the next step was the student had to listen to you know um they say the words then they had to write down the words so i just follow the pattern that you gave us mm -hmm. okay great so what step are you on now how, and how what was this leading up to? What were the, what was their end task or? Oh, oh, the end task was um, they were going to complete. Let me go down there. Uh, you know, like a clause activity, fill the blanks. You know, right? Um, yes, and also the other one was um, information gap, where the students will have part of the information, then the other one will not have, and then they you know, that was um, that part of the income. Re yeah. Related to the celebrities, you said? To the yes. Okay. Yes, that using the vocabulary that's uh, the target words of that day. <laughs> right. 
right. Okay. The same thing. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, Dora, for sharing that. And I think, you know, if you think about the initial steps that you're taking to help them uh, uh, to learn those words uh, before they're actually doing the task, the, uh, I think it's an, an information gap task, right? Uh, yes. Imagine they had to do that without the vocabulary. So the, the steps that you're taking ahead of time should help them to do that, to be able to perform that more efficiently, I would imagine. Right? Yeah. So, well, thank you very thank much you. for sharing. Yeah, mm -hmm. any, did you have any questions or comments, Dora? No, it was um, the one I said, um, the abstract words, but you said we can do translation. So that's, yeah. Well, I mean, you it is it, certainly one option or just, you know, you, using trying to define it and give examples. And of course, you know, they may not get the full meaning of the, uh, the definition of the abstract word the first time around. And certainly they're not gonna be able from, you know, one individual sentence or one definition to know the, in your case, the French specific uses of, what was the abstract word you said? Um, it's, it was saying uh, credibility. Yeah, exactly. Bon, la credibilité, yeah. Yeah, credibility um, and how it's used in French in different contexts. So that's gonna build up over time as well. So, okay, well, before we go on, does one thank other you. person, uh, thank, thank you very much, Dora. Does one other person wanna share their experience either with their entire lesson, summarizing it, or um, with any aspect of the lesson, if you'd like to raise your hand, one other person, and then we'll go on. I'm not going to call on anyone. <laughs> if not, we can also just go on unless we have another hand raise here. Shall we just go on? Okay. I think we can. I think we can. We can continue. I feel okay. Like let's just go on then. Okay. So let's go on um, to four. Um, and I want to go through these. Uh, the five items I've listed here in four for further unpacking the IBI, IBI principles for the language classroom, you know, both for lessons and also in general, just having this information and understanding of um, uh, four different types of classroom activities. The first one here is how to include repetition in meaningful input. And I wanted to give at least one more example of this. As you know, the examples I gave yesterday are for advanced ESL or at least high intermediate ESL. And I should mention the, the 2012 book I wrote was directed toward ESL in particular. Most research and I think also pedagogical inter interventions related to vocabulary to date, you know, stemming back from the 1990s and even the 1980s, has really, it's one of those areas that's really been directed toward ESL more than other L2s. I think that's changing now, but I just wanted to mention that historically that that's, that's where a lot of research on vocabulary has been done, focusing on ESL in particular. So the examples I have focus on that, the higher levels, the high intermediate levels um, and advanced levels uh, of ESL in particular. But it also can be used, the approach, of course, at any level for any L2. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But I want to mention, um, I want to give at least another example of how to include repetition in meaningful input. And Grant, I think one issue you brought up yesterday are the secondary meanings of words and secondary uses of words. And I think this example of input um, gives you an example of when you might do that. because. Even if the, in the beginning of a lesson, you're wanting to focus on meanings of, of the vocabulary that have to do with what your other goal of the class is, completing a task, working on content or otherwise. Um, later on, if you want to expand their knowledge of, different, of L2 specific meanings and uses of words, that also you can include in the input. So here's an example of, again, this is for advanced, um, advanced or at least high intermediate ESL. And this was, um, this is an activity in a lesson that comes from the book. It's called Fixing a Fixer Upper and it's about, it's about renovating houses. And so some of the, uh, a couple of the target words were crane, concrete, 
stock market, insulation, et cetera, okay? But I'm just gonna read you an example. And at least this segment of input, you can see where the instructor, when they're talking to the class, in this case with spoken input in front of a class, how they can um, provide alternate definitions of words, alternate meanings and alternate uses. So here's a, a segment of input I'll um, read here as an example. Yes, that is a crane, but a crane is also a bird with a very long neck. And a crane can also be used as a verb, such as when a person cranes her neck to try to see something. Right, that material is called concrete. Concrete can also be used as an adjective, such as when someone provides a concrete example, meaning a precise and tangible example. The use of concrete as an adjective in this way makes sense if you think about how, con um, how concrete as a substance is very solid and stable. You can't miss it. Correct, that, that refers to the stock market. Actually, it's a picture of the stock market on Wall Street. Those are buyers and, and uh, sellers. Do they look happy? Um, I can think of uh, I can think of any alternative. Can I can't think of any alternative meanings for the term stock market in and of itself. That is insulation as a material that insulates a building. There are also more metaphorical uses of the word. For example, you might say that a child has led a very insulated life meaning that he has been protected, maybe overprotected from the outside world. Is there anyone who can think, uh, who you think has led an insulated life? Okay, so here's an example of, of again, input at an advanced level for ESL, where you're, where you're providing input somewhat in the middle of the lesson, and this comes in a step four stage, uh, where you're giving alternative meanings and uses to words. And it's somewhat explicit because the instructor in this case is just spelling things out for students. Um, but that's, that's a nice example. And clearly you can see the increased number of repetitions in there um, while still focusing on, on meaningful input. Okay, B here, I had the question, how to make input comprehensible for different levels of proficiency, which has to do with P2 and also all the other principles. Um, Hold on a second. Okay. Grant, did you have something here? I, I was, I thought, I thought the handout yesterday had we were reading, but Joe, can I, can I ask a question about Sure, that? sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> I think it was really interesting to hear you reading. I don't know if anybody else caught this, but I, when you were saying concrete, right? Mm -hmm. the concrete is, if I'm correct in my English knowledge, it's when, it, when the first syllable is stressed, concrete, that's right. the, the substance, right? And then when the second syllable is stressed, concrete, yeah, That's adjective form, right? Yeah, exactly. How, no. how do you go about sort of <laughs> doing that? Because when you, I swear, when you said it as the, as you said, this is concrete, not this is concrete. Right, it, no, exactly. And, and, and so you make a good point. Technically, it's not the exact same word form when it's used as a noun versus an adjective in this case, right? Which also, as we know, happens with other verbs and noun, you know, that, that are verbs and nouns in English. Um, I would agree with you that it's a different word form. Hopefully they will naturally pick that up from the input. If they don't, you could be explicit about it and say, actually, these are two different word forms if you want. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 But good, good point. Yeah. The, we have a series of words like that in English that are interesting. <laughs> and, we, and a lot of times we're not aware of it until we're actually using them in context. But that's a good point. It wasn't the exact same word form. Uh, this is for an advanced ESL. Yeah, okay, yes, it is. These are all for advanced. So let's go on to B and talk about um, how to make input comprehensible for different levels. So already with the IBI approach, when you're wanting to increase repetition of target vocabulary items in the input, we're already modifying the input. But if we're wanting to, we're gonna modify it so that it's appropriate to the level as well. I'm giving advanced level examples here, but certainly you can adjust your input to make it appropriate for different levels. Um, C here is the question of how far to go regarding language specific meanings and uses. And I think this also ties into the example I just gave and we could actually talk about it. Do you think we went too far? 
Do you think that's unnecessary to give those alternate explanations? Should you just wait until they naturally come up in the context of other goals that um, you're attending to while working in the language, while using the language, right? Well, you know, I think students may appreciate knowing these alternative uses when you're dealing with a truly novel word form, right? Because here I talked about the different types of cranes, right? Crane as an animal, crane as a machine, and also crane as a verb to crane someone's neck. There we gave all those examples, at least they're exposed to it here, whereas they, in other cases they may not be. Um, so a decision that you can make is how far you want to go on this front. You may not want to go very far at all, but I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts or um, questions or thoughts on that issue that when you're presenting a novel word form that's truly novel, let's just say that crane is a new, uh, is a new word, you know, completely new word form for your students. How far might what you want to go in showing them alternate uses? Would you want to only stick with what your immediate goal is or would you want during the lesson to at least share that with them? Any thoughts on that? I see something here from Alejandro, even for advanced non-ESL, I can still see some issues, but thanks for the question. I think, Joe, oh, I, I, I can't see comment above. Question, yeah. would you really use such a tremendous adjective verb that, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to get meta-linguistic <laughs> if you don't want to, but in this case it did, yeah. Normally I wouldn't, but that is still meaningful because I view when you're providing input and you're explaining how, you know, you have a larger task or you have larger content issues that you're focusing on, the part of the goal is learning the vocabulary, right? If I'm, if I am learning how to become, you know, to build a house or something like that, the person is going to have to teach me the appropriate terms and their uses as well. So I view that as also meaningful. So if there's a, a certain amount of explicitness that comes into that, that I think that's okay. Here, um, I Shannon- I wanted to make uh, a comment. Oh, go ahead. This, this is Ronita. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. So, I, I can't hear. We lost, we lost you, Ronita. We lost Ronita. Hopefully she comes back. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, well, wait. Joe, Joe, I was, I was going to propose something as well. I think at least for my novice learners, when I, what's interesting, when I first started teaching, I was like, I wanted to like tell them everything about the language, you know, just like share every single thing that I knew. Right. And you, real, you realize that you don't want to overwhelm them and just overwhelm right. them with all of this knowledge. So I really stick to the, well, there was a phrase that you used, just the, the context that I want them to use it at that time, right? Because right. Chinese has so many words, particularly single characters that have dozens of different meanings. And if I was to give them all of those meanings when it's not relevant to the context that we're learning, that's just going to confuse them. It's a cognitive overload. It's too much. And of course, you know, you're going to have students who are interested and say, oh, well, what else does this mean? And you can tell them. But I think at least presenting it in terms of in front of the whole class, um, I don't want to say it's not necessary, but I think it might just, it might create more problems than, than you think. Yeah. Right. So your thought is to keep it to the immediate context for that particular lesson. I, I, I would, yeah, at least at least for novice learners, yeah, I, I would. Because then what's what's also helpful is later on when you reach the intermediate advanced stage, they'll definitely recognize the word and you can say, hey, this has another meaning, you know, that you might you might have known that it's already meaning this, but it also actually serves to mean this as well. Yeah, I, I you know, I would tend to agree with you, Grant, in terms of the immediate context of the lesson. And, um, but, but also just being willing that a, being aware that a long term goal will be to ultimately they'll need to get these L2 specific uses and meanings. And it may come up in the context of when you're working on it, because if you have a, a word whose meaning, you know, for example, in this case, as a verb that, that's similar to the a noun, for example, um, or at least it's related semantically then they'll, it may come up in the context of this, this discussion anyway. But no, I appreciate that, that comment on that. So let me see what Shannon said here. It says that comes up with my Spanish students when I talk about using accents. They don't believe that English language, that the English language has words that have completely different meanings attached to the same subset of letters. Yeah, it's interesting how learning L2s can, you know, uh, make us more aware of what's involved in our L1s. That's a great point. Um, I have used the Freyer model, ask the opposite of the words. How do you compare IBI with the Freyer model? 
Uh, Yolani, did you want to talk about that? Asking for the opposite of the words. You want to give an example of that? What you're talking about? Is Yolani here? Yes, I believe. I believe. If you want to, or maybe we could come back to that because I'm not familiar with the details of what what this activity would be in terms of. Okay, and. Um, any other comments or thoughts on this issue on, on, on C? Okay, well maybe when the other people come back, we can come back to that because I think, who else was here, Grant? That Where was Ron Ronita, but we lost Ronita when she went to talk. Lost her, okay, maybe. I think, Joe, if I can, if I can add on, I think uh, in terms of C, I also, I'm also thinking a lot about our learners, right? Uh, I work with, 14, 15, 16 year olds. Some teachers work with seven and eight year olds, you know, right. it's a totally different context for how much they can add on linguistically. Right, exactly. So uh, realizing also that this, you know, there's a principle about building up over time incrementally, but I think also being aware, it may be also useful to you to, if you, if you, if your goal is to limit, you know, the, uh, the different meanings and uses you want. But the long-term goal to be proficient in the language, um, to increase your proficiency will be to ultimately include those. So, um, okay, so for D, moving on to D, uh, knowing what to expect from different tasks. So this, has, this is related to principles six and seven, and I'm gonna show you the other study on sentence writing here in a second. And what I just wanted to say based on uh, related to the sentence writing study that I presented yesterday is what the Topra model is indicating. And what I think what the results of the study indicate is, is not to say that, you know, writing sentences is never a good idea. No, it can be a good idea, but the question is for what and what are you expecting, right? So I think when we interpret research findings, it's important to know that they, they're just telling you what to expect with regard to a certain variable that you're looking at, right? And in this case, we were in particular just looking at L2 word form learning, not other aspects of learning that can be, um, that, that can be enhanced by different writing tasks, right? So, and we found that that act of writing words in sentences, which tends to be an activity that people think, oh, this is a good idea. It's gonna help them to learn the words. Well, it's not going, it, the research indicates that it's not going to help them learn the word forms. And it, it, as a matter of fact, it seems to be getting in the way. And I tried to give a, a from the Topra perspective, a theoretical explanation of why that may be. Um, I wanna take some time be, before continuing this to show you um, another study, oops, going back here, uh, that, was a, that was done by Wang and Pian that was also done on sentence writing. And this is kind of a follow-up to the sentence writing study that I showed you yesterday. They also assessed the effects of sentence writing, but did so with um, English speaking learners of L2 French and L2 Korean. Their findings also indicated large negative effects for sentence writing. And they also found that the scores in the sentence writing condition of the L2 Korean learners were much lower than those in the L2 French learners overall. And they also found that the L2 Korean learners were more negatively impacted by the sentence writing tax, which you can think of reasons why that would be the case. They concluded that the negative effects of sentence writing are more pronounced when the, an L2 script is more distant from one's L1, which provides support for the role of L, first language to second language orthographic distance in, learn, in the learning and retention of L2 words. So, and this pattern suggests the more novel L2 word forms are, the more the increased semantic processing tasks. So tasks like answering questions about word meaning or sentence writing or um, yeah, different types of semantic tasks can decrease L2 vocabulary learning more. So let me show you the results of that study. Oh, well, first of all, let me show you the words they use. For those of you who teach French, here are some French words, but you can see it's a similar design in terms of the way they work it. It was a partial replication of the L2 Spanish study that I showed you yesterday. So here's some nice, oh, look, they use the word crane, grue, right? 
And uh, those are the French words. And for those of you who teach L2 Korean, okay, here were the, um, the L2 Korean words they used. You can take a look at those with the romanization too. Okay. And then here were their results. This is pretty interesting. So if you look at the French side, you see something similar to what we saw yesterday with the Spanish sentence writing task, where the no sentence writing task, the situation in which they could just simply process the target words as input without having to write them in sentences, resulted in much <clears throat> higher word learning scores. But then we look at the Korean side, and first of all, you can see overall they learned fewer words, okay, which is interesting in and of itself. But look how much the sentence writing uh, task affected the scores on the right side. You can see it was more impactful in a negative manner for L2 Korean. So I just wanted to share that. And I'm gonna go back up here to, if anyone wants to see more of that, I'm gonna go back up to the outline again, but did anyone have any questions or comment on that? I, the point I wanna make here is that semantically oriented tasks, you, if, you're learning something novel semantically, like what I was showing you with the example with Crane, that may be more useful in the long term in terms of the gains that you're gonna get in terms of vocabulary knowledge, right? Because knowing that Crane is an animal and knowing that Crane is, it can be a machine and that you can crane your neck, all of that is part of learning the word Crane over time. And on the semantic front, we're learning different meanings and, and they're novel perhaps for the L2 learner. But if it's based on your own experience and you're just elaborating semantically by writing words in sentences or answering questions about word meaning based on your own previous experience, that may be help learners be, to be working with the word. But what we should not expect is for that to somehow lead to the word form learning. So any questions or comments on that? Okay, D, what to expect from, uh, oh, excuse me, E, keeping a toolbox of research findings to increase vocabulary learning in the L2 classroom. So um, this is the last principle, the last IBI principle. And I think it's something that can be really useful. And so I, in another slide here, I provided you with what I think can be an initial toolbox. <laughs> and it, I don't know if it looks like a toolbox. It may look like a bunch of toolbox, but here is, uh, a set of, in this case, at least 10 concrete research findings that you can apply in your language instruction to increase vocabulary learning. So I'll just let you take one minute to have a look at them and then see if anyone has any questions about them. And when I say incre increase repetition, I mean of the target words, right? Increase time of exposure for the target words. So I'm just curious, can you, like, you, this does not have to be a long response. Can you just elaborate what you mean on tone variability? Okay, great, yeah. So tone variability would be fundamental frequency, the level at which you're speaking. So, um, what, you know, if you say um, chair, chair, sure. um, okay, th that would be tone variability. Like pitch. And, and it's interesting that that type of acoustic variability for speakers of English and other non-tone languages like, like uh, Spanish, in, when they learn vocabulary in an L2, they don't seem to benefit from it. However, if you speak a tone language like Zapotec, and this is what we did a study with, with on Zapotec, we found that those speakers benefited from, in this case, learning L2 words in Russian, right? Um, let's see the questions here. Background music, any specific type? The, the study that I'm citing, that I'm referring to here was done by De Groot, and it was classical background music with no lyrics, um, while using music while presenting the target words, okay? Yeah, any other questions in the chat about this toolbox? I, I have a couple more, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Um, when you say thematic sets, is that like what I was talking about earlier? So the themes of, of words like classes or foods or hobbies or places? Right, and this is another issue with textbooks. They tend to present words in semantic sets, so all the fruits and vegetables, right? But um, the problem with that is you have all these novel word forms, 
and semantic space that overlaps. And so there tends to be um, interference. And there, there's been studies that demonstrate that. A thematic set would be telling a story, for example, right? The, the frog was jumping on the lily pad and then you know swam across the lake and reached the shore of the lake you know that kind of thing would right. be a thematic a thematic set and that but i think you could also say a thematic set would be dictated also by uh a task a particular task in task-based instruction uh that you need to complete because it wouldn't necessarily imply all from a same semantic group any other question? Wouldn't music be a distractor for some students? I'm thinking of neurodivergent student. Yeah, into, you know, of course, there, there, the, there's the question of individual differences in how students respond. Um, but this study, the overall mean, the one I'm referring to here, uh, found that overall the learning was better with, um, with the classical background music. But your point about individual differences, uh, who is that? Alejandro? I think is a good one, right? There's also recent, and, and vocabulary is a really interesting area because a lot of times you get memory research in general that overlaps with research on L2 vocabulary learning. And a lot of memory researchers will in, you know, get out, uh, will, will use L2 vocabulary um, as a, a way of testing different types of memory. The most recent one uh, finding I would mention, I think from that area is that Exercise, doing exercise prior to study also uh, facilitates word learning. So that was another one. Okay, so just because of time, I'm gonna move on here and go back to the, um, go back to the outline. The last thing um, I wanna talk about before some final uh, session for qu final questions and comments. And again, we might go over by about five minutes today. Um, is options for existing textbooks with the IBI approach. And I just wanna say a few words. Um, you can think of the textbooks that you use um, and maybe they don't, um, they don't have some of these limitations that I'm gonna mention here, but it's something that you can consider. Uh, these are some common issues with L2 textbooks that I think can be addressed by IBI by incorporating if not an entire lesson, the principles of IBI where you can bring in more input during the initial stages. So um, some have insufficient planning in establishing target vocabulary for the test, uh, uh, excuse me, for the text. Like someone mentioned before, frequency lists can be useful on this front, getting your learners um, to advance um, in the most frequent words in the language, that's not always taken into consideration. Sometimes insufficient opportunity for students to process target words as input before the completing the task, besides lists or just pictures. Um, the instructional materials don't take this on themselves. I wish they would do it more so, and I think it would be useful. Um, insufficient repetition uh, of target items in the input. Insufficient focus on target word form. A lot of times it's only one repetition of the word form and then sole focus on meaning and sometimes insufficient focus on L2 specific word usage. Um, and that, you know, I realize is gonna have to come from input that goes beyond just isolated lexical items that are presented in a book. You're gonna need input at the sentence level and at the, um, at the discourse level to learn all L2 specific word usage and meanings of, of words over time, right? Um, so going back. Let's see. And going back to the outline, that those were the main things I wanted to talk about. And um, now we're at number six here. So we have time for questions, comments, and discussions. Uh, questions, comments, and discussion. Again, here's my email and also some resources on the publication site. And I'm gonna leave this just for a minute here and then I'll, I'll do, I have the evaluation thing again. Um, let me see here in the chat uh, if we have more questions. Let's see. Uh, Shannon said, Alejandro, just let those who want to try to use their earbuds. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I was actually thinking of some students who despise classical music. Well, they'll revolt. We don't want that. <laughs> uh, can you put contact in the chat, please? Oh, 
My email, you mean? I got it, Joe. Okay, I can type that there, sure. I'll just type my email here. I like my email, it's nice and simple. <laughs> Except for Washington University, St. Louis, the Wusto part is not so simple. Um, Joe, and, I, I, I have a question. If, if sure. I, I'm curious, I think it doesn't apply to me because Chinese does not have conjugations, but I think for a lot of teachers here, Spanish and French, I'm wondering how the vocabulary acquisition process also applies to verb verb endings and conjugations and if there's like any overlap for, with when looking at like now like acquiring nouns and versus acquiring i don't you know proper conjugations for lack of a better word if that makes sense right well i think mostly what i'm dealing with would be the lexical form part right so when it comes to morphology you know we have two types of morphology right so the the, the inflectional part I think typically that's considered part of morphosyntax, right? So um, the patterns that you're using, so, so what I tend to focus on is what you would say, a, a, a form meaning connection that is one-to-one, -one, right? You have the, the form and you have a meaning, regardless of how complicated the meaning may be, it's an idiosyncratic meaning and that's represented in your mental lexicon, right? Uh, when it comes to verb endings and other types of inflectional morphology, there you're applying um, a pattern that is one to many, right? So, for example, in Spanish with all AR verbs, for the ustedes, the third person plural form, it, you would always have aron at the end, right? right. So, aron, you have to learn that form in the beginning. But then once you're applying Spanish inflectional morphology, right? And you're, you know, I, I, I think that's more part of your morphosyntactic system. So I would be more interested in how you, as Aaron, as just its initial form, mm -hmm. and then all of the different verbs that, you know, would go with that when you're exactly. using your personal yeah. plural. Um, so in a sense, that goes beyond what my focus would be. But the more that you, I think the better that you know the forms, you know, it's, it's part of it. Sure. Did that answer your question? I think, I think so, yeah. So it's almost like a different, it's a different branch of like vocabulary. But, yeah, but I will say, it's, it's like a different branch, but I will say one thing about derivational morphology. So with derivational morphology, and this is something that I think my students in my Hispanic linguistics class really like. Here, you can get more vocabulary by knowing a single morpheme, right? Mm -hmm. So in, um, in Spanish, for example, if a, if a fruit like apple, manzana, ends with a, you can change it to a, um, a tree by just changing it to o. And you can do that with different types of fruits. So you have tree, you have apple, and you have apple tree, and then you can also have apple orchard by putting al. So there, the der derivational morphology, and they love it. They're like, oh, I have all these new words by just knowing this one new, this one new affix, right? This one new uh, suffix. So they really appreciate that. So there, I think that may be more directly tied to vocabulary knowledge, right? Technically. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So a, a manzano is an apple tree. And then manzanal, or manzanar. Well, there's an RL also, it, you learn a little bit about phonology too. But you can do that with, um, I think you can do that with wheat, you can do that with bananas, you can do that with other fruits. And it, it generally works, but there's always the exceptions where it doesn't work. And they, they appreciate that. Where, whereas in English, we do that with, uh, I think like, tree and then we say grove and we just add it you know we add an additional word so but that in that derivational morphology really can get you a lot of words if you learn that i think yeah. you mentioned that earlier um yeah right? yeah chinese chinese definitely has that yeah the roots yeah absolutely absolutely and pointing that out i think can be really useful yeah any other questions before we go i know it's a it's about 11 20. awesome thank you so much joe okay great applause snaps <laughs> all the fire emojis that you can put in the chat possible uh, please take some time to fill out the feedback form, not just to get an entry into our giveaway, but of course to give feedback to Dr. Joe Barkoff, who has been fantastic for us here at this PD Extravaganza 2022. The floor is open to questions or comments if you have any, and we will hopefully see you later today. Thanks, everyone. I hope it was helpful. And if there are any remaining questions, I'm happy to, uh, to talk or either in the chat or...
I think we're maybe people are ready to begin the weekend. Almost, but you have more coming up today, right? I have, I have another one in 40 minutes. Tune in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording here.